Bank treachery on the Western Front. How will Albanese respond? And Paul Keating is right about the ASIO goon show. Coming up on today's Citizens <laughs> Report. Welcome to the Citizens Report for the 7th of March 2024. I'm Elisa Barwick. Joining me today is Citizens Party researcher Richard Barden. Welcome, Richard. Thanks, Elisa. And on today's show, we're going to be talking about the shocking case where no less than 60 bank branches in regional Western Australia are at risk. And then we're going to talk about the latest, uh, always notable comments from Paul J. Keating, former Prime Minister. Uh, regarding the latest uh, ASIO unleashed spy scandal, again, um, all things China pointing towards, you know, the drive for war and uh, a few other subjects on the war drive that we'll discuss too, so stay tuned for that. Uh, now, don't forget, uh, subscribe if you haven't already and you can ring the notification bell. Um, we've got lots of updates coming thick and fast lately, so we'll notify you of new material. Uh, you can also share this using the share button function as widely as possible to get the word out. And uh, also comment below, that'll help get the word out and get it circulating. Uh, and also you can find in the box below information about contributing to our campaign. You can donate to help the Citizen Party and you can also subscribe to our regular weekly Australian alert service as a way of supporting what we do and all, all, always um, all the backup info that we don't get a chance to talk about on the show is available in there. Uh, now, straight on to our first topic, bank treachery on the Western Front. How will Albanese respond? Now, uh, yesterday, uh, Robbie suddenly started getting calls to his phone urgently from 6PR in Perth uh, because they had uh, one of the bank representatives from Bank West over in Western Australia coming on their program to announce the closure of 45 Bank West branches in Western Australia. Now, there's 60 banks in total um, that are Bank West that are all at risk. Of course, Bank West is owned by the Commonwealth Bank, so yeah. what they're saying is they're going to save 15 of those regional branches that'll yeah. be rebadged. Yeah, they'll just change the sign out the front to Commonwealth. It's owned, they've owned it, they bought it lock, stock and barrel um, during the GFC, so they've had it about 15 years. Mm. Yeah, so, and remember, CBA had uh, pledged not to close any bank branches not only in the duration of the regional banking inquiry that's being, you know, that we're involved with and engaged with to stop the shocking closure of regional and rural bank branches, um, but they basically said they wouldn't close any bank branches until I think it was 2026. Mm, any regional bank branches. branches that's right. Which and of course, is the little. And yeah, yeah the, hence the, the treachery in the title. Yeah, and the definition of what is regional and what is not is always up for debate, as we'll find out as we listen to some of these clips too. Um, because, yeah, Robbie raised that issue when he was on 6PR yesterday. Um, but uh, before we go into that, I want to give a quick update because this is happening in the context, as people might have been getting wind of, and we talked about a little bit on last week's show, of the global, a new global banking crisis, and there's numerous warnings, we won't go through all, them, all of them today, uh, but just to mention that there are a number of voices that are calling out the possibility or probability of a new US banking collapse. Of course, we're only a year out of uh, the last one, which we saw Silicon Valley Bank, Signature mm. Bank, a number of uh, regional US banks collapsing and there was a um, bank term funding program not unlike, unlike the one that we had in Australia that was initiated a year ago by the US Fed to pump some extra money into those regional banks who had all seen their holdings of US Treasuries devalued mm -hmm. by the rise in interest rates and so basically what they counted as assets on their books were being wiped out um, and there were runs on the banks and so forth. 
Now that bank term funding program, which the Fed announced in January, is going to end on the 11th of March. Just at the time when there's a new bank crisis erupting, uh, with particularly the case of New York Community Bank Corp, which is another one of these regional banks that's also running into trouble. And part of the reason for that is that they had actually taken over Signature Bank during last year's crisis. Mm. Uh, and they'd had other mergers as well, which had all been approved by the Fed. So basically, again, as we've seen since 2008, concentrating the too big to fail problem mm. rather than actually addressing the issue and solving it with actual bank regulation, which is the same issue we're facing here in Australia. Yeah, this is the same. They've, they've done all this by, I mean, they built all this problem up by unwinding the controls that were put in place after the 30s, after the, the Great Depression, to mm. stop it from happening again. Um, particularly the Glass-Steagall separation that we've talked about a lot on the show because, yeah. um, you know, all of these, these uh, I mean, the, the, the marking to market, the losses on the Treasury bonds is a separate issue, but the, the reason for all of these, you know, these shotgun marriages and all this stuff that they're having to do with these banks is um, it's because of that systemic problem that they've caused by removing the controls that, that stopped any of these systemic crises from happening for over for nearly 70 years until they repealed that law in um, 1999. Mm, yeah, and now a new problem is brewing and there's a series of articles coming uh, out of the Asia Times that's reporting this and they're written by a former US diplomat who's writing under a pseudonym, Ichabod. But he's now saying that in the same way that these regional US banks have seen their, have seen their US Treasury bonds devalued on their portfolios, they're now seeing their mortgage-backed securities devalued. Of course, these are the very instruments that mm. triggered the 2008 crash. Um, at the same time, he went through how uh, a number of these US banks are facing default on commercial real estate mortgages that they've lent out, and they are just nowhere near, um, they don't have enough liquidity whatsoever to deal with that problem. Uh, plus, you have banks, US banks that are loaded up with derivatives, which is a fuse in and of itself that can detonate a much, much bigger bubble if some of these banks go down. And this, um, this US uh, former diplomat pointed to the fact that uh, a new crisis of these dimensions is going to be the first real test of the bail-in laws enacted under the dog Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform Act passed after the GFC, um, which as we've talked about a lot on this show, would confiscate people's deposits um, to keep the banking system going. Um, and he noted that that didn't happen with the banking crisis of one year ago because the authorities knew that confiscating uninsured deposits would cause a bank run on mm. every American bank, not just those smaller ones. Yep. So they, they just couldn't do it, and they're not going to be able to do it, which is why yeah. um, we need the real solutions coming in. Yeah, because you want to talk about derivatives contagion. These, these regional banks still, by and large, I mean, comparatively do mostly just actual banking. They're bit players in the, derivative, in the mortgage-backed securities market, which didn't used to be a market at all. Again, the, the government institutions securitise mortgages. Banks didn't trade these, these mortgage-backed securities um, until you know, 25 years ago. Mm. So, um, I, you know, there were small exceptions. But, so yeah, this, this is just, uh, this was always going to happen. And now they're arguing about which non-solution they're going to apply or not. By their own rules, they should have, that they, their own laws said that they couldn't do any of the things that they did to, mm. to bail out, temporarily bail out this problem. The only solution to this is going back to the mm. regulations, the pre-1999 regulations. And you have to remember when you think about the Australian banks, because everyone knows, you know, our banks are super profitable. But you've got to think of that framework that we just laid out, because whilst they might be making massive profits, this bigger issue, this global financial problem is always in the background. Um, and, you know, we have the expiry of some of our programs that handed out free money to the banks mm. taking place as well. So the closure of bank branches you know, they're thinking about their the poc the hip pocket, right? Mm. Raking money in, um, and so coming back to what's happening in Western Australia and what was announced, um, these banks uh, 
are essential for the livelihood of regional communities and yet on 6PR yesterday after um, they had one of the bank honchos come on to justify why they're closing all these branches and, and again painted out to be you know providing more services as they've been saying at the, at the various inquiry hearings uh, rather than the reality that it is. Um, Ollie Peterson, the host, had both Angus Taylor, so the shadow um, finance or treasurer, and David Littleproud, who used to be a banker, had both of them on, um, and basically they were both forced to address the issue. One of the problem of these bank closures multiplying and, and not coming to an end, despite the fact that there's an inquiry into this whole process, mm but also to address, because Ollie raised it with them, about the necessity for some public banking alternative, which was really interesting, and he brought up um, our proposal for a post office bank. So I want to run some of these clips, um, and then our Robbie's response, because Robbie um, was able to come on and get a full ten and a half minutes to talk about this after both Angus Taylor and David Littleproud were on the show. So this is the clip of Angus Taylor, where he's forced to address the issue of, um, you know, cash basically heading out of existence and the post office bank. The shadow treasurer, Angus Taylor, is also in Perth today and he's standing opposite me in the studios this afternoon. Uh, g'day, Angus. It's good to see you. G'day. Great to be with you again. Now, coming to the bank west, closing all of its branches, yeah. does it disappoint you? Of course it, it, it disappoints me if particularly if there is going to be big impacts on customers and employees. And, and my thoughts go to customers and employees that might be impacted. Now, we've had assurances uh, from the bank uh, that they will be looking after customers and employees. We'll be holding them to account on that, Ollie, and uh, we'll be watching very closely to make sure they do as they say they're going to do. Is this sort of an insight to the future, though? Do you think we're all going to have to buckle up for digital banking? Uh, no, I think cash is going to be around for a long while. And, um, you know, I'm a great believer that cash is an important part of our monetary system and will be for a long, long time. Um, I know there's some who would like to get rid of cash. Mm. There's some in government who would like to get rid of the cash. And this is a good question for the current government. Uh, but I think cash has an important role to play and, and, and will for a long time. Now, not every bank, it's not compulsory for a bank to have cash. But I tell you what, uh, I think there's going to be demand uh, for banks to have cash for a long time yet. Bankwest isn't the only one, obviously, shutting branches. A lot of them are doing it. And WA is a big place, as you know. Mm. I just floated the idea with David Little proud of the post office bank. Mm. Is that something you c would consider as well? Do we need another public bank? Yeah, and this is, it's an idea that's been around for a long while. I want to see more c competition in the banking sector. Yeah. I, I, and we, we are finding now that there are problems, particularly for small business lending. Mm. It's getting harder. There's no question about that. And there'll be small business people listening today who have found it hard to get loans. I think it has got harder than it should, and we need competition in the banking sector to make sure small business people can get loans. So, so he was much better than David Littleproud on the Post Office Bank, and we'll roll that clip now. But, you know, the fact that they're having to address this is our work. So listen to David Littleproud. If you have just joined us today, Bank West has announced its transition to a digital bank in 2024. It's going to result in the closure of 45 branches by October this year and convert 15 regional locations to Commonwealth Bank branded branches. And they're hoping to have that all completed by the end of the year. We'll keep taking your calls on this throughout the afternoon. But the leader of the National Party joins me in the studio this afternoon. David Littleproud, it's great to see you. Yeah, good to be back in Perth. Bank West was obviously formed as the Farmers Bank, as the Agriculture Industry Bank. I mean, this is a kick in the guts, really, for all West Australians, particularly regional WA today. Oh, it is. And this is a, a, a breaking of a promise by the CBA. They made a promise that they would not close any branches until 2026. Uh, so they can't be tricky and say, oh, no, it was only CBA branches. Bank West has been an integral part of the CBA since the GFC and, and the CBA uh, bankrolled them and got them out of trouble. 
Uh, so the reality is this is a broken promise by the CBA. We need more competition in the banking sector, not less. Uh, I've got some concerns also with the Suncorp ANZ merger. Yeah. Uh, that, that was another agricultural bank out of Queensland. Uh, and this is where I think we need tougher competition laws, whether it be supermarkets or banks, to make sure uh, that we have the services that we deserve and need, particularly something as universally uh, necessity as, as cash. And you just mentioned the Commonwealth Bank promise there of a guarantee that doors will stay open on branches till 2026. But by converting 15 regional branches to Commonwealth Bank that were Bank West, I mean, there's no guarantee they're still open in two and a half years' time. No, that's tricky. All they've been is tricky and they're playing on the fact that they've got two brands over here. Uh, and I get it, they, they wanted to merge them into one at some point. But if you make a promise to the Australian people and you're the biggest bank in the country, mm. we'll follow through with it. Otherwise, you don't have a social licence to operate in this country. And I think our big banks showed that. Uh, they've got to get back to their, their knitting. And just understand, they say all these branches are unviable. That's because they look at them in silos. And if you add in the business banking and the agribusiness, they make a lot of money out of these, even these small country branches. So people should shop around and particularly farmers and business uh, businesses who bank with the Commonwealth Bank should go and try and find someone else to to uh, use uh, rather than them because they are making millions of dollars. I used to be a bank manager for NAB out yeah. in the bush in Queensland. I can tell you my agribusiness book was making millions of dollars. Uh, even though the branch might have lost a couple hundred thousand dollars, that doesn't matter. They were making a lot, these banks. Hey, David, is there now the opportunity to explore the idea of a public bank again? Is even the post office network a solution? Well, I think the, the licensed post offices is a solution then. I've written to Anna Bly, the, the Banking Association chairman, to say, why don't you make investments in licensed post offices and force all the banks to actually up the rate that they pay for each transaction, make some capital investment in the infrastructure within the, the post offices where they could actually have someone come in and do a home loan interview uh, in the privacy of the post office. Um, work with that because they're, they're mum and dad, small businesses out there and particularly in regional areas. Uh, Anna Bly has given me all the platitudes in the world but there's been no action. I think that is a solution. Yeah. And particularly when you're out in the bush, uh, you can't jump on a bus and get to the next suburb to get to an ATM. No, you, you can't. You've got hundreds of kilometres to get there and, and cash is important particularly in, in regional remote areas. So I think the post offices have a role to play But I, and I've even said it to Matt Common. Be proactive. This thing is coming. There's a Senate inquiry already on. Mm. And we had promises that nothing that they wouldn't close anything while that Senate inquiry is on, let alone their promise to 2026. So the CBA's got a lot of explanation to be made here. Uh, and I think Western Australians should feel uh, particularly aggrieved by what the, what's happened. So, yeah, this is interesting too because he was forced to be tough on the banks in mm. regard to the fact that they that Commonwealth Bank, which owns... Westpac, uh, sorry, Bank West, broke their promise, which they have made because of the heat put on by this inquiry, that they wouldn't close branches. Um, but then he diverts when he's asked about the post office bank. He doesn't actually come out in support of a post office bank if you listen care carefully. He says, oh, I've talked to Anna Bly about, to Anna Bly, the head of the Australian Banking Association, about how the banks should invest more in the post office branches so they can provide more services. Mm. So basically just invest more, provide the funds that they should be providing to bank at post mm. to plug the holes that um, the bank closures, regional bank closures are creating. Um, so, you know, he's not actually endorsing, as Robbie points out in the clip we'll show you in a moment, uh, at all the postal bank solution. Um, and as, as Robbie says in this clip, uh, he's said to us personally that he doesn't support the Postal Bank solution. A little proud, that is, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we'll listen now to Robbie's response, a couple of clips here. Uh, firstly, where he's addressing Ollie's concern that, you know, what is going to happen when the CBA, who is saying that they'll keep these 15 rebadged Bank West branches open, what will they do after 2026 when um, this moratorium they put on branch closures ends? And then in uh, respect to the post office bank and why the government, we can't leave it up to the banks to mm. do the right thing. The government's got to regulate them. So listen to Robbie about that. Well, that's it. You've only got one bank branch in places like Bridgetown, Corrigan, uh, Condon and Lake Grace, the Narrabeen, Newman, Pemberton, as you just mentioned, their wage, and they're all going to stay open, be Commonwealth Bank branches. And the Commonwealth Bank is 
uh, you discovered, Robert, through these inquiries, has said they're going to keep all of their branches open until at least the end of 2026. But what happens then? There's no guarantees. Well, the, and that's the problem because they're, they're tricky. These banks, bankers are tricky and, frankly, they're dishonest. Now, can I say, though, I don't expect much different from them because um, they are going to try and run a business to their maximum advantage, right? That's not To me, that's not the issue. The issue is they have a social license and it's up to the government yeah. to put conditions on them and say, no, no, this is what acting responsibly is like. Um, and so when Commonwealth Bank promised uh, when the, the current hearing, the inquiry got up that they wouldn't close branches, that was great. But then they started closing branches in places like, say, Gold Coast suburbs, which they, in their own documentation, they regard the Gold Coast as regional. But for the sake of closing branches, they said, oh, no, that, that, that's uh, metropolitan. We only said we wouldn't close regional branches. And then the big one is Western Australia, mm. because suddenly they don't, they, and, and David Littleproud was right to call this out. They promised they wouldn't close regional branches, but they said, oh, we didn't mean the Bank West branches, even though they own Bank West. For the people like me in rural Western Australia now who have uh, who are having this relationship on the phone that Mr. Spittle was saying is a wonderful relationship, um, there's a lot they're not going to be able to do on the phone, and they're going to wish they had that branch, and they're going to find they've been abandoned. Yeah, and they're not going to be alone. The other banks are going to look to follow suit here, uh, Robert, as we've mentioned before, it was good to hear David Littleproud this afternoon say he has already written to Anna Bly, the boss of the Australian Banking Association, and explore the idea of that post office bank, which you and I have spoken about on a number of occasions. A government, as you say, they, they're going to have to step in here because they're operating, again, in your words, with a social licence. They, they do They do have to step in. They have no choice. And, and one of the, the there's a lot of benefits for a public post office bank. And, and, and competition is one of them, but real competition. Because what we've had in Australia is this four pillars policy with four big mega banks. And there's a lot of private um, competitors have tried to start up. And every time they, they either fall by the way, or, by the way, or if they're successful, one of the big four buys them up, right? Um, so they always make sure they don't have competition. The only entity that could truly step in and compete with these big four is the government, which is what Bank West used to be, which is what the Commonwealth Bank used to be. In fact, the reason those banks are so significant in their markets, the Commonwealth Bank nationally and Bank West and Western Australia, is because they had the confidence of the public because they were public banks, yeah. right? So we need to bring that model back. And I think I mentioned this last time we spoke. I, I got to testify at the inquiry on the 1st of December in Canberra, and I made the point that we know this will work. We know if, the, if there's a public postal bank set up, it will stop the banks closing branches because it already has a public post office bank has already stopped Australia's big four closing branches, just not in Australia. It happened in New Zealand. Mm. Our banks own their banks. And when the New Zealand government in 2002 set up Kiwi Bank as a public post office bank, the first thing the banks did was stop closing branches. And they didn't, they didn't touch them for the next seven years, whereas before that, they'd shut 1,300 in a couple of decades, right? They were spooked completely by the competition. And that is what we need to, in order to get these banks to lift their game. Because at the moment, you're right, they're just looking for who's going to normalise this first. And so Commonwealth Bank is saying on the one hand, I oh, know we're going to be the branch bank. On the other hand, it's their subsidiary that they've set up to normalise this. And then the other banks will go, well, they've got away with it. And, and they're looking at the government, Ollie, mark my words, these banks are looking at how's the government going to react to this, Right. And so they're going to go, well, if Commonwealth Bank, if Bankwest has got away with it, we will too. Now, can I just correct you, though? Um, I've had a discussion with David Littleproud about a postal bank. Um, he, uh, I don't think you should misrepresent him. He told me he doesn't support it. Huh. Now, I'm only, saying, I'm only saying that for one reason. It's, it's not good enough anymore, Mr. Littleproud and Mr. Taylor and Mr. Albanese and Mr. Chalmers to, to, to write to the Banking Association and write to Anna Bly. They are the ones pushing this. You cannot treat them like a reasonable player in this. They have betrayed the Australian public. This inquiry has shown that. The government has to pull rank. And so this is up to the people now, your listeners. And, and the difficulty for Bank West customers in WA now, you're angry. You want to change banks. But where do you really change to? Because the others are in their own, all in their own way, have done equally bad stuff. 
where do you really change to unless we have this public option? So what you need to do is while you're looking for an alternative to change to, get on the blower to your local member, federal member of parliament, especially if you live in a uh, marginal Labor seat, by the way, right? The seats they're going to want to keep for the election, all those seats that, you know, won, Western, they won. Yeah, to see you're reading WA, day, right? exactly. All the, if you're in those seats, you get on to your local member of parliament, your federal one, and you say you must go with a public post office bank. You must do it. And that'll that'll sort of fit. We're in a pre-election era period, right? That will feed up to the people at the top because what we need to happen is Jim Chalmers call up Anna Bly and their buddies apparently and say, listen, Anna, you either tell your banks to stop closing branches and reverse these decisions or I might not have a choice but to go with the public bank. Is that what you want? So... You know, we'll come back to talk about this, the fact that they've, you know, these politicians are being forced to move. We've shifted their position, just like in our show last week, we talked about how um, the opposition, the coalition party, was forced to oppose removing Section 11 from the Reserve Bank Act. You know, they didn't want to do that, but at a certain point they're forced to move. But before I get to that, I want to roll one other video, and this is coverage from Win TV. Uh, from the last several days and this just um, comes back to what David Littleproud was saying when he said you know um, put it back on the post office because here you have the head of the licensed post office group Angela Cramp who we've interviewed for our Citizens Insight show a number of times um, discussing how much of a burden that these closure of bank branches is putting back onto the local post office and then you'll hear um, Senator Jared Rennick uh, proposing, again, the option of public banking. The place we would usually post a letter is becoming the central point for face-to-face -face cash services. Just because you live in a rural community doesn't mean to say you should go without financial services. Today was the final time submissions would be taken for an inquiry into bank closures in regional Australia. Local Post Office Executive Director Angela Cramp says it's businesses like hers that are bearing the brunt of an exodus of banks in rural areas. It, it has required us to do more work and to be more vigilant and to actually manage it better. And while she agrees post offices can facilitate cash access to those who need it, Angela wants banks to foot more of the bill for providing that service. There is you know, a burden now being put on Australia Post to manage that cost and that needs to be addressed. There's no doubt about that. And I'm not sure that the post offices uh, are able to provide all the services that a bank actually provides on top of their existing post office services as well as their passport services. More than 600 banks have closed across regional Australia since 2020. The next step for the inquiry will be a public hearing next month. And the last option is to go back and have a public bank like we once had with the Commonwealth Bank uh, and uh, basically that stays open in the regions. Angela just hopes a solution can be found. The government needs to actually work out how they manage it. But the banks can share their $10 billion profit lines to help that be facilitated. A final report should be handed down by June this year. Courtney Burke, Win News. Yeah, so... Um, you know, the, the problem has become so blatant by the lack mm. of banking services in the regional communities and the heat that our supporters out there have put on through this inquiry process. This is what's forced these politicians to be tough on the banks. Now, we mm. have to move them more. We have to move the David Littleprouds, who you would never expect in a million years to push, you know, to be in favour of public banking mm. but um, it can be done and in fact one of the examples of how it can be done is with Kiwi Bank in New Zealand um, because and and this is also what can happen in the context of elections because as Robbie pointed out at the very end of that clip that we played on 6PR um, we're actually in the lead up uh, there's got to be a federal election before September 2025 and a lot of the seats that won Albanese government, mm. the marginal seats, are in Western Australia. So something like this happens with these bank closures that are going to affect a lot of regional communities. 
and the people are going to be up in arms about this. And so we will be running, uh, as we always do, because we don't just start campaigning before federal elections, we'll be running campaigns um, now to mobilise people in those particular electorates mm. to get them on the job of fighting for our post office bank because we do have, as we announced on last week's show, and as has been in motion for a time now, our legislation uh, that will be put up by uh, Federal MP Bob Catter for a People's Post Office Bank. And we will be aiming to have this tabled in the coming weeks and months ahead as soon as it's humanly possible um, to raise these issues. And this will really uh, escalate the heat under Albanese and his government, what are they going to do? They're going to have to respond. Mm. Um, and I think it's really interesting, you've got to ask the question, the fact that the Commonwealth Bank couldn't even wait till the end of this inquiry, and they the inquiry actually reports on the 16th of May, it's not that far away, but they couldn't even hold off this announcement until the end of this inquiry to you know, shut these 45 branches, mm. holus bolus, and then 15 others at risk. Yeah, you have to wonder what they're thinking in the, you know, the whoever's making these decisions. They're, they're uh, as we've remarked before, they, they're almost doing our job for us. But, oh, yeah. But it's it's <laughs> like the old Aesop fable, right? I'm a scorpion, it's my nature to sting, mm. right? Why would you do this? You know, everyone knows this story, the yeah. frog the frog carrying the scorpion on its back and the scorpion stings it and then they both just sink in the water and drown. Both die, yeah. Yeah, so the scorpion's effectively killed itself by being a scorpion and that's what that's what they are. Yeah, no. They, these... can't, change, they can't change their nature, it seems. And they operate... But government can. Well, that's, that's the right. Point. The banks are operating within a framework, um, you know, of the global financial system, which they're locked into. It's only governments that can um, intervene from outside of that framework and say, let's change the framework. So that's what has to be done. And um, yeah, an a great example of that is the establishment of Kiwi Bank, where you had this um, battler by the name of Jim Anderton, who um, created the Alliance Party and who was absolutely passionately committed to creating a public bank such that he would be out on the streets in election campaigns with a loud hailer and with signs and so forth campaigning for a people's bank. And um, I want to show this cartoon actually because uh, this was something that was used to mock him that, you know, you're a lone voice. Um, and this cartoon, you know, talks about when he faced expulsion from the government caucus because he was demanding this banking proposal and of course, you can see the members of the caucus saying in the middle there, you are on your own now, Jim. And Anton's effective response down the bottom, that's exactly how it is. I do feel lonely in here within the circle, but I'm not lonely out in the streets. Mm. And the masses of the New Zealand population, as we're seeing now with the masses of the Australian population, support this kind of change. And they're not going to go quietly particularly as this global financial crisis worsens and we have some major dramatic developments, like, like imagine now 2008 style crisis shocks mm. hitting in this environment where we've got this proposal for real solutions on the table. That's going to have a huge impact. So what happened in the 1999 New Zealand election is that Jim Anderton um, was in a position to strike up a coalition with the Labor Party government or forming government of Helen Clark. Mm. And it was based on the premise of, he agreed to sign up to a coalition on the premise that they would allow some sort of post office savings mm. bank. And all of that was yet to be negotiated. And we've written in our Australian Alert Service the details of this and we've worked with people in New Zealand um, that, have, that can tell the story and you can watch our Citizens Insight show um, that we've done in the past with um, a former New Zealand MP, Matt Robson, who discussed this at length. Um, and it's a brilliant example for Australia to look at. One, because as Robbie said in his interview, uh, the Australian banks have been forced to stop bank closures in the past because they did in New Zealand, because mm. Australia, New Zealand's bank are Australian's banks. Yeah, they own, our, our big four <coughs> own all of their big four. Exactly. So they've had to do it before and it did stop the bank closures. Um, very effectively. 
But the second reason is because you see how it works, where in the context of an election period where the, the popular opinion is shifting, um, one man can make a huge difference as John, um, Jim Anderton did. And it was really interesting because they had, <clears throat> uh, when they were trying to flesh out exactly uh, this commitment to a People's Post Office Bank that they'd agreed to to form the coalition, they had been going for hours and hours um, trying to beat down Jim Anderton and he just wouldn't budge. And it, at the end, um, one of the ministers said to the other, look, Jim's beaten back every argument against the bank we've ever put up. For God's sake, give him the bloody bank. <laughs> and the other minister said, oh, all right then. <laughs> and it was just at a certain point, yeah. um, a fait accompli that, you know, the bank would start. And of course, there's been a battle to actually make the bank function in the way that he envisioned. And they've... Um, had a struggle to keep it going because like anything you know nothing is perfect once you create it and then it's done and you go all go away go home and go away and mm. say it's, it's done now you have to continue to fight for that um, for what it is that you established and but that's what we're faced with now in the coming period uh, if we continue to put the heat on we can achieve this. This is something that actually can be done, especially when you have the father of the house, Bob Catter, who's been passionately committed to it in a similar way to Jim Anderton, but also a growing number of voices from across the political divide that because of the economic crisis and the regional you know, uh, crisis in so many areas across Australia, that we need to turn our economy around somehow and you can't do it without mm. banking, you can't do it without yeah. credit. And obviously all the present strategies aren't working, so... Better think of something new, as Matt Canavan said a little while ago. That's right. Um, now, we have um, two more hearings taking place. Bec uh, well, there might be more. The committee's, um, the RARAC committee that's running this bank closure uh, inquiry is committed to having as many as necessary. So, the, actually, there's three, I should say. I already told a lie. But there's on next, I uh, believe it's Tuesday, the 13th of March, there's a hearing in Western Australia in Tom Price. So Robbie will be travelling up there to be at that hearing next week. Uh, then there's a hearing at Bribey Island on the 16th of April. And I forget the date, but I believe it might be about the 25th or so of April that the third hearing takes place in Canberra. So there's still going to be ample opportunities to put the banks on the stand and to really uh, roast them. Um, and the, the senators have been doing a great job of that. So stay tuned for more and we'll move on now to our next topic. Paul Keating is right about the ASIO goon show. Now, I want to just situate this topic um, in the backdrop of the war drive, we're going to be talking in terms of Paul Keating's comments about um, the simmering drive to uh, convince Australians to consider um, China our enemy and to adopt um, uh, or to, or to uh, position ourselves with the, our dangerous Anglo-American uh, allies, particularly the US, for what would ultimately be war against China, unwinnable war against China. Um, but firstly, on the Russia front, which has been, of course, the forefront of the war drive for some time now, um, there's some very stark developments. Um, of course, you know, everyone knows it's the um, unsaid secret that clearly Ukraine has lost the war um, and that is causing some desperate actions but also admissions and revelations about what has mm. been going on all along. So there's been a series of things, including the fact that um, admissions that NATO countries have been assisting Ukraine to operate the missile systems that have been donated to them mm. yeah, because they had, couldn't operate them on their own. Yeah, particularly air defence and long-range missile yeah. systems. These people would have heard of these HIMARS launches, the, the various types of cruise missiles, uh, missiles, storm shadows and and so on, that the British and French have been, you know, they've been sending people over there to do the targeting and to operate the, the systems and just, you know, pretending that they're volunteers. Yeah, and the New York Times also confirmed that the CIA and the MI6 have been, quote, on the ground mm. assisting Ukraine. 
um, the head of NATO, Jen Stoltenberg, was giving a speech talking about the delivery of F-16 fighter aircraft and in that context said Ukraine has the right to attack targets outside of its borders. Yeah, because the, the F-16 is a multi-role fighter. It can be used to launch long-range missiles, air-launched air missiles, um, which they're also supplying and, yeah. as we said, sending their guys to help with the targeting solutions. And, and the implication of that is Here's the head of NATO saying, encouraging Ukraine to strike yeah, targets. To deep. use that apparatus to attack Russian cities, Russian infrastructure. In Russia, not just in Ukraine. So expansion of the war, um, you know, officially beyond what it already has been. And then the French president, Emmanuel Macron, uh, also pointed out in a speech, he said, sending troops on the ground into Ukraine cannot be excluded and discussed uh, a coalition being uh, created to enable Ukraine, and this is the words he used, to carry out deep strikes within Russia. Mm. Um, and one example of that kind of coalition effort is the British Defence Minister on the 15th of February announced a UK-Latvian drone coalition to provide mm. drones to Ukraine. Of course, they've already used their drones to make strikes on Russian territory, as we know. Um, now, Chancellor Olaf Scholz, the German Chancellor, responded in the wake of those comments by Macron, insisting there would be no German participation in the war. He said, I will not send Bundeswehr, the German army soldiers, to Ukraine, um, implying that, you know, other countries will. And in fact, he discussed the delivery of Taurus long-range cruise missiles to Kiev and opposed that, he said, Germany will not help with target control assistance like Britain and France did. Mm. So he admitted they are already doing it and yep. the Brits absolutely slammed him for admitting that. Yeah, which they should have, if they were smart, it shows you how panicked they are, they're usually smarter than that. They should have shut up. They confirmed it by objecting yeah. to him saying that. Oh, you you know, don't, don't give the game away. Everybody already knew, but now it's officially confirmed, as you said. So. Exactly. And the other official co confirmation that came out was this, that this leaked recording uh, was indeed accurate of a phone meeting between top German Air Force officers about this potential tourist deployment where they, in the conversation, they were actually discussing um, destroying the Kerch Bridge. Yeah, how many... How many of these missiles would it take to blow up the, the Kerch Strait Bridge? That's the bridge between uh, the mainland of Russia and the Crimean Peninsula. Yeah, so that was confirmed that that was indeed um, for real. So all of this is coming out, which um, is very, very important. Now, the Americans, though, uh, including Defence Secretary Lloyd Austin, admitted that if Ukraine, quote-unquote, loses the war that NATO will be in a war versus Russia. Um, and Russia responded to that saying, look, you know, here's proof. Mm. It's them that want to expand this war. You keep saying we want to expand this war further into Europe, but, you know, we've never come out and said as much. You're now saying mm. NATO will go to war against Russia if Ukraine loses. Mm. Now, of course, Putin's address to the um, federal, um, uh, federal assembly, assembly. Yeah, on the 29th of February. The, the combined houses of the Russian parliament. And this is his uh, annual um, address. Yeah. Um, he put a real fine point on it. He reviewed a speech he gave in 2018 where he um, explained new weapon systems and he basically announced in this address that those weapon systems were either complete or almost complete. And he addressed the aggressors from NATO and the US, UK. He said... They must grasp that we also have weapons. Yes, they know this, as I have just said, capable of striking targets on their territory. Everything they are inventing now, intimidating the world with the real threat of a conflict involving nuclear weapons, which means the end of civilization. What do they not, do they really not understand this? So uh, while some media have painted this as Russia threatening nuclear mm. war, um, it's quite the oppos opposite. He's saying, look, you know, these guys, by their provocations that they're threatening, are threatening mm. to set off nuclear war. And we should also mention that it's also been officially confirmed from multiple sources that, yes, there was a peace agreement two months yeah. into the fighting 
um, and that it was the British and the Americans that told that that strong-armed Ukraine into pulling out, yep. keep fighting, keep fighting, keep fighting, and they're still doing it. Yeah. So it's them that wants this war, not yeah. Russia. Russia, yeah. Russia could have had a war any time it wanted. It held off for eight years before it went into Ukraine, um, because yeah. it was left with no choice but to do so, yeah, uh, as we've covered right. before. So again, it's it's all you, you've got to you know understand how this looks from Russia's perspective. How many times have they been invaded from mm. from the the West? Um, yeah, you know, haven't been invaded from the east for a thousand years. Yeah. <laughs> the and and then you get these Luftwaffe generals talking, waxing nostalgic about the last time they took on the Russians. When was that? What was the context of that? How many Soviet, you know, as it was then, Soviet Union citizens died? The conservative official estimate is twenty-seven million, half of them civilians. Mm -hmm. And that's and that's what they're fondly reminiscing about. How, you know, if your enemy believes that you're at war, you are at war. Mm. And, you know, that's, that's where we are now. That's the insanity of this whole, you know, yeah. just try, trying to keep hold of this, this power that, they've, that the, the Western so-called world has had. And it, it can't be done. All they can do is blow up the world in the process. That's right. And that's also it's the same exact reason for painting China as a threat mm. because uh, it's not actually any kind of military threat threat but it's a threat to the global status quo as you mapped out there so um, I want to read out uh, it, what Paul Keating said in his comments but just to situate that um, he was responding of course to the broadside announced by Mike Burgess from ASIO yeah. last He's, week. has this annual threat assessment speech I call it the, the state of our police state address um, you know, all about how good ASIO is and how bad China is, or he never actually says China, but it's obvious to everyone that that's generally who he's talking about, um, or wants people to think he's talking about. Um, and so, yeah, the latest one was this whole big, uh, which we'll t talk more about in a minute, but this whole big thing about how, oh, they've, you know, people are betraying their country and now we've, you know, and we're stopping them and, and uh, uh, making this whole big song and dance in the middle of this ASEAN summit that's happening in yeah, Melbourne, yeah. or right in advance of it. So he was pointing to uh, a former member of parliament supposedly selling out his country to a foreign spy agency, but of course didn't name mm. who the MP was, who the foreign country was. Um, but what's become very clear is that it's drawing upon all of the propaganda we've been and you've been exposing for years um, which much of which has been proven to be a complete mm. sham. Proven in court, I should add. Yeah. And, um, and some of the journalists, one journalist in particular, um, and a couple of other guys who are no longer around, um, but they've lost multiple court cases. This Nick McKenzie, who did the, the interview with Burgess mm. um, from ASIO subsequently, uh, they've lost, they've been sued multiple times. The ABC, when he worked there, the... the um, or this joint project they had, um, and then at nine, Fairfax and now nine. Um, the article that got all of this foreign interference stuff rolling and the, and the show that they did to accompany it, that he presented, has been pulled off the internet because they got sued over it and lost. Yeah. Because it was, you know, it was just a complete fraud. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then that's, but that's what all this, is, all this foreign interference stuff is built off. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, so I'll read his statement because uh, he doesn't uh, miss, miss a, um, a target. <laughs> so I think Paul, it just speaks Paul for itself. Keating, yeah. yeah, Paul Keating. He said, It doesn't take much to encourage Penny Wong, sporting her deeply concerned frown, to rattle the China can, a can she gave a good shake to yesterday. But before she did the rattling, the resident conjurer, Mike Burgess, who runs ASIO, gave us a week's worth of spy mysteries, only for us to find via a leak to the Herald and the Age that the mysterious state running the spying was, you guessed it, China. The Kabuki show runs thus. Burgess drops the claim, then out of nowhere, the Herald and the Age miraculously appear to solve the mystery. The villain, as it turns out, is China after all. The anti-China Australian strategic policy establishment was feeling some slippage in its mindless pro-American stance and decided some new China rattling was overdue. When the Albanese government was elected, the first decision it should have taken was to dismiss Burgess, Andrew Shearer and Mike Pizzullo. In the event, Pizzullo shot himself, but unbelievably, Burgess and Shearer still remain at the centre of a Labor government security apparatus. 
This says more about the government than it says about them. These people display utter contempt for the so-called stabilisation process that the Prime Minister had decided upon and has progressed with China and will do anything to destabilise any meaningful rapprochement. Burgess runs the primary goon show while Shearer does all in his power to encourage Australia into becoming the 51st state of the United States. Yesterday, Anwar Ibrahim, the Prime Minister of Malaysia, dropped a huge rock into Wong's pond by telling Australia not to piggyback Australia's problem with China onto ASEAN. Anwar is making it clear Malaysia, for its part, is not buying US hegemony in East Asia, with states being lobbied to ring-fence China on the way through. That difficult task, the maintenance of US strategic hegemony, is being left to supplicants like us. What this week's ASEAN meeting makes clear is that Australia and Australian policy is at odds with the general tenor of ASEAN's perceived strategic interests, that is, interests which relate to China and the United States and relations between them. Yep. Here, here. And as everybody who's watching this probably knows, we have many, many issues with uh, various oh, yeah. policy positions that Paul Keating took uh, during his time as Treasurer and Prime Minister, but his... On foreign policy, he was he was the last Australian leader who ever actually stood up for any kind of a sovereign foreign policy mm. um, to any great extent. So, and he's right. Um, and to prove he's right, Labor has no response to this except just. I mean, Penny Wong. It just she came out and said, "Oh, I find it novel to be to have Keating thinking he should have to you know to be lectured to about the the country I was born in, Malaysia." Well, she was born there and left when she was eight, 47 years ago, roughly. Mm. Um, and what, that's supposed to somehow give her some great insight into Anwar Ibrahim, the Prime Minister, current Prime Minister, having said, having not said what he said, which, is, which Keating was quoting back to her or paraphrasing back to her. He, Anwar Ibrahim said, do not impose your problems with China on us. We do not have a problem with China. That's... Exa that's what he said. Yeah. Like, how is that in any way ambiguous and subject to Penny Wong's supposed, you know, um, you know, nuanced interpretation that Keating allegedly doesn't have, mm. which is what she's implying? It's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, Andrew Shearer, um, we should mention for those who don't know, is the head of the Office of National Intelligence, the former ONA, um, that the peak uh, intelligence body that's attached to the Prime Minister's department and does all of the strategic assessments for the Prime Minister. Mm. And so that's what gives him this um, influential, this influence in the position he's in and why he should have been got rid yeah, of. Yeah, yeah. And now this, of course, is um, the utilisation of the foreign interference laws. And I wanted to mention um, the other laws which are working, will work in tandem with that, which you've just written about, mm. which we can talk about briefly now. And people can uh, read more in the last two issues of the Australian Alert Service. Richard's written this up. And that is the misinformation and disinformation laws, the mm. quite infamous laws that are being brought in to um, censor yeah. the, the internet. Because um, one of the things that was alleged in this context is that, and this was uh, last year, um, ASPE, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, which runs the whole anti-China propaganda operation, mm. had alleged that Chinese state-backed social media bots were... Um, propagating and, um, you know, enhancing uh, what comments that Paul Keating, Paul Keating had has made. been making and, and even the, our anti-bank campaign. Yeah, yeah. The, oh, well, this is obviously foreign interference. They're undermining out because they call these things all democratic institutions, right? It's a, this catch-all term. The free market, the, the privatised Commonwealth Bank and its, you know, fellow now big four um, this, this is, and the, and the mainstream media that lie about everything or repeat Aspie's lies about everything are, the, are our democratic institutions that we can't undermine because that's an offence, a criminal offence now or would be under this law mm. that would make this media regulator the, the unquestionable arbiter of truth on the internet. Mm. Now this is, um, just briefly, this is, and there's a video, maybe we can put a link to it in the, in the description. Yeah. Because um, I don't have time to do it justice now, but a former... State Department official in the Trump administration, um, but whose thinking is much wider than just some sort of partisan, mm. you know, like a lot of these guys, is saying, look, this has been going on since at least 2014, where the United States government, the Army, the Defense Research, Advanced Research Program, um, DARPA, 
agency. They, um, they invented the internet, what became the internet. They privatised it when they realised it wasn't going to work for the purposes they had intended it originally for, sort of a redundant communication system and all this stuff. Um, and then they championed free speech on the internet as a way to be able to support these regime change operations on mm. the cheap. Um, and then when it stopped working for them around 2014, the, the, the counter coup, as he called it in Crimea, and the Donbass republics breaking away that this war in, you know, all this is still going on now, um, they started cracking down. Um, and they had always been keeping a close eye on these um, insurgent, political insurgent groups in Europe and, you know, like us here, um, making sure that they, but particularly in Europe, because they didn't want it threatening NATO and the EU. Um, if any of these guys got in power and decided to pull out. Then Brexit happened in 2016 and then Donald Trump got elected, which he en he'd end up just following their agenda anyway. But the point is he campaigned on the opposite and he wasn't supposed to win. He wasn't supposed to get a look in. Mm. And he won, you know, fairly comfortably in the end. And so they have been pushing this thing ever since um, to censor the internet, to set up these agencies and these, these pass these laws to just wipe out anything that doesn't conform or debunks their agenda. So it backfired on them, basically. It, yeah, their, their internet freedom thing backfired yeah. on them, which it was always going to do, yeah. eventually. Um, but they weren't prepared for it at the time, and so now they're trying to get all these, get their ducks back in the line. And so in Europe, they passed this thing called the, uh, the Digital Services Act that um, does all the things in terms of censorship and, and just you know, removing political content that the, uh, that the ACMA bill, the, the misinformation, disinformation bill would do, over, would do here. And Michelle Rowland is over there by her own proclamation in a speech um, in, in Brussels, I think it was, where she's saying that, yeah, we're modelling what we're doing on what you did. Yeah. You know, so... Which um, is all part of kind of a trans-Pacific trans flank, you described it, um, for the US utilising Australia as a forward operating base for mm. war on China. Yeah, clamp down on all the political dissent, which is what this over five-year-old case that ASIO is going on about now, because that's when the foreign interference laws passed that would have made whatever this person did illegal, supposedly. Yeah, yeah. Um, And now, and, and, you know, they're, they're, they're one step behind, and so they're trying to clamp down on any political dissent on the internet with this misinformation bill, which... Even their own enforcement agencies, other than ACMA, their own watchdog groups, statutory watchdogs, uh, just rejected out of hand as completely unworkable and likely to be struck down by the High Court as unconstitutional. Mm. But they're pushing ahead with it because, you know, Big Brother America, NATO, that whole crowd are telling them to. That's mm. what's going on here. Mm. Yeah. Yep, so this is all part of one and the same picture and um, if you haven't called your Member of Parliament lately to complain about this, to complain about the bank branch closures, particularly if you live in a Labor held, um, tightly held seat mm. that might be up for grabs at the next election, make sure you do so, mobilise other people to do so and we'll keep you posted on what the next phase of the mobilisation will look like. But that's the show for this week. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks Richard. Thanks, Alyssa. And see you again next week. Authorised by Robert Bowick, Citizens Party, Melbourne.